many of them have told me that this issue has shattered their lives and how the trust in people and institutions that they always thought were reputable and respectable have been totally destroyed. That this has made them rethink everything they thought they knew and believed. And some have told me that they've made a 180 degree turnaround philosophically. And so I'm, just to conclude here, I'll just you know, note that I'm sometimes told how overwhelming all this is and I'm asked, so what can we do? And uh, I've got to be honest, I've been so busy staying on top of this journalistically and consoling devastated and distraught parents behind the scenes that I haven't really put much thought into how to go about activism or crafting sound in public health policy. But I will urge you, all of you, if you're in this room, I'm speaking to you, <laughs> to find unconventional ways to make these medical atrocities and harms visible, find ways to get attention, enforce the conversation, and um, remember that speaking the truth is powerful. So please do something. Um, you're hereby drafted into God's little army. <laughs> and we determined few are not content to allow any more children to be sterilized and sliced up in service to a hideous lie. Thank you all. circles, there aren't people that want to give all the detail that sometimes is needed to make the point about how serious this is. Um, and, uh, you know, often people look at me like this is a very complicated thing. They'll, they'll look at me and be like, but don't you love other people? Don't you want to be kind? Um, but it's interesting that it really is as simple as we have people whose mind and body are not aligned. And instead of saying, let's redirect the way you think, let's work on the mind, Instead, we say, let's mutilate the vibe, right? You can go either direction. And in Virginia, one direction is legal. And for counselors to try to encourage a kid to realign their thinking, it is now illegal in Virginia. Um, that is and should be enough to make you angry that this is a true force of government affecting our kids in a very deeply personal, life-altering way. Um, and, I, and I walk into churches every day and I tell these pastors, I said, do you know the counselors sitting out here who two years ago could have helped your youth who were confused can now only send them in the direction of body mutilization rather than working on what, what, is, a, what is a biblical center view of how God made me? And I'll look at the youth pastor and I'll say, do you know what that means? You don't lose your counseling license if you do it. So guess who it's on now? It's on the church. It's on the parents. It's on the people who would speak out um, because they've done everything they can to shut down that message, including literally making it illegal for the people who theoretically could help best realign our thinking, right? Counseling, health, mental health professionals. Um, so I just appreciate Brandon's approach on this um, because it's, it's needed. Um, it used to be we would talk about these things and they were in um, a little bit of a vacuum, right? These things are happening during the political circles. Now we don't talk about them anywhere without them being very personal to a lot of people's families. Uh, this is hitting everyone, a friend, a niece, a nephew, someone in your family. It's a lot like when we talk about the life issue, we know we're walking into a room of people who someone is supposed to board it, if not many people who have been touched by that. And so um, when, you, when you walk out this issue, it's with a matter of, of truth and grace and understanding the mercy and compassion and the difficulty of family members trying to work through how they handle when this happens within their own um, family. Um, and, and I'll tell you, um, at the Family Foundation, um, I really kind of, when I got to the Family Foundation, I really got passionate about um, this thing I was seeing in the church, which is we're very educated. We listen to a lot of stuff, but we don't always do anything about it. And so the Family Foundation is intentionally what I call a do tank. We are not a think tank. We do plenty of thinking, but there's a lot of people that do a lot of thinking, so we don't have to do a lot of the thinking. Our job is to take the thinking and put it to motion. So when I ask Gwen, what do you want 
out of this time together, she said, I just want to make sure that we are engaged, that we are doing it. I want it to be a verb, not a noun, you know, not a stay put thing. And so um, I've given you a lot of materials, look through them uh, at your leisure. Um, I, I used to give out one or two things and then everybody always asked me, well, what about this thing that you guys do? So now I just bring a whole slew of stuff and um, you can look through and um, it'll help answer questions about um, what the Family Foundation is. But our mission as a whole is to preserve and promote the family because we believe that that's God's design for a flourishing society. That's the fundamental building block that he gave us. Um, and we take that at his word when he says, so in the beginning God created male and female in his own image, and male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and go multiply. We believe all of that. We take that seriously. Um, and our mission is accomplished in a variety of ways. The easiest thing, if you're unfamiliar with us, is to sort of, this is like a little uh, icon grid to how we do what we do, but um, it, it'll give you a little bit of framework. We believe that if we're gonna if we're gonna turn Virginia around, if we're gonna make this a thriving society for our families and our children and our uh, grandchildren one day, we have to rebuild it by first influencing hearts and minds. So we do a lot of things with the church, trying to get pastors to actually preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. We do a lot of things with the next generation, trying to help them have not just scripture over here and life over here, or scripture over here and political views over here, but actually what is the foundational lines of how we form what we believe and then what we do about it. Um, so we do a lot of things on that front, but all with the purpose of, is that ultimately we get a majority of Virginians that understand God's word and the, the, the principles that are in there, and then we, we go and we make good voting decisions so that we elect people who don't do things like ban the ability to help somebody a kid who needs help on this gender uh, transformative issue. And so we do a lot of accountability things along the way, trying to help people know who are your elected officials and all that. So people know us for different things. Um, but the whole goal is you have people who are making policy that impact your literal family and could be the entire life of your child. Right now that is on overdrive. Um, and so we've been trying to do this, this mission that we have, um, for about 35 years. And I'll, and I'll tell you that, unlike 35 years ago, I was not there 35 years ago, but um, I have been there 20 years. And unlike 35 years ago, I would rather to say that most people right now would say, society certainly isn't thriving. This is certainly not what it looks like, and they certainly don't appreciate God's design for the family right now. And just for a few minutes, what I thought I would do is really help you work through the, the biblical account for engagement. Why is it um, that we think it matters to engage? Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, God's word and what he says on this, and then what he's, I'm hoping that I'm just going to open the door for what he's calling you to do, um, specifically that he would be able to speak to you personally about this is, for me, what I can, the step that I can take. Um, and I'm gonna start really basic. The world is really broken. I mean, that sounds basic, but it was broken by sin in the garden, and God's perfect plan was corrupted, and henceforth, forevermore, there has been original sin. And another way to look at that is this idea of light and darkness, right? Scripture speaks about it all the time. Um, and John 1 says it really well, right? It, you know, first, in the beginning was the Word, referring to Jesus, and then it says, in him was the life, and the life was the light of men. Now, with original sin, rather than light, you've got darkness, right? Without Jesus, we have no light. Very simple. We're unable to see. Um, and the Bible talks all about blindness, right? This inability to see. Um, and blindness is often referred to as the effect of sin, both personal sin and original sin. So an example would be like in Zephaniah, there's a prophecy that says, I will bring distress upon men, and then it says, they shall walk around like blind men because they've sinned against the Lord, right? And then Deuteronomy talks about how sin causes people to grope around in the noonday light. I don't know if you remember that verse um, it's, uh, in chapter 28, but you know, in the noonday light, they're groping around just as blind men grope around in the darkness, right? It's like, it's light out, but they can't see. Um, now, Obvious question here, but if you're blind, and, and maybe you know somebody that's blind, would you drive a car well? Would you drive down the road in the right direction, know where you're going, be able to find the landmarks? No. So routinely, why do we expect blind, fallen people to drive our society well? We do this all the time. <laughs> what you're seeing around you, when you hear this stuff that you just heard about, and when you look at the public policy situation in Virginia, 
Um, a lot of you are very tuned into this issue of transgender guidelines that are going in our public schools. When you look around um, and you hear things like, we've legalized recreational marijuana, and we've, you know, we've, uh, General Assembly almost shut down Christian adoption agencies this year because they, heaven forbid, believe that they should adopt into a home that is best for a child, and they view that as having a dad and a mom. And for that, we almost literally said, nope, can't work here, not in our commonwealth. Um, when you see this stuff, um, that is simply a factor of blindness. There are public policy decisions made every day by fallen people, and more specifically than that, they're made by people who don't know Jesus and therefore don't have the light and are blind. Um, now, I'd like you to think about um, the battles you're seeing in your locality right now, right? So every locality right now is dealing with critical race theory, transgenderism, you name it. It is happening at your school board. Um, and you just need to look at this and imagine, literally, that people just simply cannot see truths when they don't know Jesus. And sometimes we should question when we see Christians that are walking around as if they're blind. What that means is they're not walking in the light, right? They're not actually grabbing what's out of the word and experiencing it and living it out. But I want to I read something in scripture um, about light. It says, 2 Corinthians 4, 4-6 through 6 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So you get this section, and just before this section, it literally talks about how the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. Literally, the God of this age has blinded the people who are unbelievers because they can't see. What Paul's saying here is that believers and unbelievers are not the same. It's not that it's not like they, it's not like we have one set of facts that Jesus died, rose again, you know, um, is 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 the ultimate victor. It's not like there's this set of facts and we think it's true and they don't think it's true. It is literally, and maybe you've experienced this where you've sat down with somebody who doesn't know Jesus and, and literally you can read the same words, but you get it and they don't. And in fact, they'll fight against it, right? Like they just, it's just not clicking. That That is not simply a disagreement over facts. That is the fact that maybe for Holy Spirit revelation, when we when we come to Jesus and we experience and we say we surrender, we get this Holy Spirit revelation. When we read scripture, we actually can pull out truth and light principles that are given to us by the creator of this world. And honestly, that's why we pray and sometimes we sing in hymns, open the eyes of the blind. It's because we're not, it's not about like, they're so wrong, they're so evil, it's so bad. It's they can't see. They can't understand the things that we understand. But here's the good news. Like, the, all of Scripture is filled with the fact that Jesus spent most of his time on earth, lots of time, restoring sight. Right? That's what he was doing. He was healing the blind man. And these miracles, I don't believe, are just for the person that he healed. I believe they are to tell us that when we get into a relationship with Jesus, we get new vision. We get totally new vision. And that's why we see these things so clearly. That's why, to us, it is unfathomable that you would mutilate somebody's body rather than help their heart and their soul and their mind realign with what God gave. We can't, it, it is, it makes absolutely no sense to us, but that's because we get this new vision and we are healed from our blindness. Now, most of you are thinking, okay, I've been a Christian a long time, I get this, been there, got it. But here's the kind of the next piece of this that I think we oftentimes forget. All around us are people that are blind, but not only do we need to be healed from blindness ourselves, but we also need to be assured that we're not being led by the blind. So let me refer to the words of Jesus on this. He says in Matthew 15, verse 14, that Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. You might remember this. And he says, leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, they both fall in a pit. It's right there. And it's pretty common sense. Um, in the most basic sense, we have Jesus saying blind people should never leave because they can't see, and they don't know where they're going, and they're not going to take us in the right direction. Um, and they're not equipped to give directions to other people. I share this verse because it's the staple reason that I work in public policy. It's the reason that I engage at this level. In our country, in our commonwealth, we actually have choices over who leads us. More so, if we could have been born today in North Korea, and we might not be able to do a thing about it. But that's not where 
we are. We actually have choices, and I will tell you, in Virginia this year, we have a lot of choices. We have choices that are, we can choose a new governor, we can choose a new lieutenant governor, we can choose a new attorney general, we can choose a new house of delegates. So any, the only thing we actually can't change this year, there's only one thing at the state level we can't change, which is the state senate. And guess what? That's almost a tie between liberal and conservative ideologies, although individual bills are, you know, it depends on the moment. But the tie is also broken by somebody we can change, the lieutenant governor. So we can change almost every single thing in Virginia. We have those choices. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you that isn't a political statement. It's to say if we see a lot of blindness and a lot of bad decisions made by blind people, we do have the ability to engage that and to say, let's stop the madness, right? And at the Vineyard Foundation, we just actually believe what Scripture says when it says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice, and when the wicked rule, they groan. We're seeing and feeling, and we know of a whole lot of groaning, and it's because we have blind people making terrible decisions that are impacting our family. Um, so let me just really briefly unpack what this means for us. If you never thought about um, voting this way, but have you ever thought about if you choose just I'm not going to vote. It's not important. It doesn't matter who's leading me. It's all the same. It's politics. It's out there. It's, have you ever thought about you're literally letting a blind person get into a proverbial car with you and drive you off a cliff? And you're choosing it. You're just, you know, you could stop it. You could try to be a part of stopping it, but you just let them drive you off the cliff. Um, I would highly recommend step one, and this sounds really basic, is don't do that anymore. Get registered to vote. At least start walking down that path. Yes, you are one person, and yes, I understand all the election integrity stuff going on. I understand the frustrations. Systems are imperfect because we're imperfect people. It doesn't mean we just throw our hands up and go, can't fix it anyway, not going to do anything about it. That is for sure. That is, that is actually grabbing the blind person and putting them in the driver's seat saying, definitely, I want to get in your car. That's crazy. Right? I know we're not that crazy, but sometimes we don't, we're, just, we're just kind of influenced by the frustration, and the frustration leads us to inaction. Which is, which is like the worst way, if you find yourself in a place of anger and frustration that you're seeing around you, but you aren't A, going to the Lord about it, and then B, acting on what he tells you, where he's convicting you to engage, it's probably not the right kind of healthy, righteous anger, right? It's probably worldly, just, you know, um, disengaged frustration. That's a different thing. So... All this to say, that's kind of a basic piece, but if someone's blind doesn't know Jesus, we shouldn't expect them to fully understand, for example, religious freedom. We shouldn't have expected that they know why we needed our churches open, why worship, collective worship matters, right? I mean, we shouldn't have expected people who don't know Jesus, you know, when, um, and I, I don't know, for example, I have no idea what Governor Northam's relationship with the Lord is. I don't. But, I, but when he says God's with you everywhere, sure, that's true. You can worship everywhere. He said that in a press conference. But... He is missing a piece of our faith, which is by your Christ, there's things that happen when we get together, right? But we should expect that, right? We should understand that they don't. We, we have to understand that our legislators, when they pass the Virginia Values Act, which I did put, that's the only long thing on your, in your packet of papers. Everything else we try to put not too many words, because that's written by the lawyers. So that gets wordy. But we did put in there something about the Virginia Values Act, because that has tremendous impact on our churches and our Christian schools. Because we now have a law in Virginia that is the same thing if you hear about the Equality Act at the federal level. We have the same thing here in Virginia. We went ahead of the Equality Act. And we basically said, oh yeah, by the way, we're going to tell churches and Christian schools and everybody else that if you have somebody on your leadership team, let's say you have a teacher in a Christian school, and they step outside and practice, they live a lifestyle counter to the tenets of your faith. And that might not just be the gay lifestyle. Mind you, we have a lot of other tenets about sexuality and other things that this isn't a singling out one thing. But if they live outside of the tenets of your faith and you go, uh, that's a problem. You know, maybe they're pregnant outside of wedlock as a result of sex out of marriage, right? We have a tenant on that, right? If you try to fire that person, that is now illegal in Virginia. That is now considered discrimination, not discernment about unified leadership around tenets of faith. We just made that illegal because we have blind people who can't even understand why that matters, right? But if someone's blind doesn't know Jesus, should we expect them to understand basic biology, what we're talking about with Brayman here today? Should we expect, you'd think so, because it sounds so unbelievably crazy that there would be something other than two forms of physical bodies that we see on this earth. Instead, we have 26 plus genders, and actually, if you listen to them very carefully, 
There are as, this is a quote from one of their leaders, the, the, there is as many genders on the spectrum as it takes for you to find yourself on that spectrum. So it's unlimited. Don't, don't think there's like whatever he named and all the ones he didn't name, there's more. I kid you not, I wish I were kidding. And so by the way, what that also